Hello and welcome to HRTC 7's answer to today's video in which we are going to go on a journey down the rabbit hole of youth team football or soccer in the United States of America. Before I start, I just want to address something that often crops up on any US related videos that I make. When talking about association football in the USA, I often use the word soccer because that is what the majority of Americans call association football and also because I sometimes make comparisons with other sports and since there is another sport called football that is popular in the United States, sometimes using the word football to describe association football can cause confusion. The term football, which many people think originates from the fact that football is a sport in which you kick the ball with your foot, was actually originally used to describe an array of different ball sports that were played on foot as in while standing up, which tended to be peasant sports, and the term was used to differentiate these on foot sports from the horseback sports typically played by Britain's landed gentry. That is why the governing bodies of rugby union and rugby league clubs in England are called the RFU and the RFL, literally meaning the Rugby Football Union and the Rugby Football League. And it's also why so many rugby clubs have the suffix FC, like football clubs, meaning football club. That is why the English invented the word soccer, which was just a contraction of the word association, in order to distinguish association football from other ball sports played on foot. The term remained in common parlance in England right up until the 1950s, when football began to become the more prevalent term. Meanwhile, soccer had already been exported to the US, and they decided to stick with it, given the presence of another sport, which they had called football. I'm aware this is an outrageously long introduction, but I get lots of people complaining about me using the word soccer whenever I make a US related video, so I thought it would be easier to provide some clarification on that front. So if you're the type of person who gets annoyed about Americans calling association football a name that we came up with and then decided that we didn't like anymore, you have my sincere apologies. But I reckon there are probably bigger hills upon which it is worth dying. And whilst I personally call it football like most Brits, it's no great hardship to occasionally call it soccer when making a very US-centric video for the benefits of our friends across the pond especially considering they make up 15% of HITC 7s viewership and they've always been very kind to me on this channel. Anyhow, I will now begin my video about the problems with US youth team football. I mean soccer, damn it. Somewhat counterintuitively, whilst this is a video primarily about some of the challenges facing youth team soccer in the US, I want to start with some of the positives. Because I think we all need some positivity at the moment, and there is actually plenty to be cheerful about for Americans with regards to their future talent within the world's most popular sport. For a start, investment in youth development has increased and continues to increase exponentially, with the MLS injecting $100 million a year into coaching and developing young players now, compared to just a quarter of that amount only five years ago. This continued increased investment has paid dividends, resulting in an increase in the number of homegrown players who are making it in the MLS, a significant lowering of the league's average age, and a number of young players breaking into the national team. The US MNT is currently the youngest national team among any nation in the top 25 of the FIFA World Rankings. Greg Verhalter's most recent squad didn't feature a single outfield player over the age of 30, there were 7 players aged 21 or younger, and 6 teenagers have made their international debuts for the US in the last 12 months. This is in stark contrast to just a few years ago, during the 2018 World Cup qualifiers, when half of the US MNT squad was over the age of 30, and Christian Pulisic effectively dragged the squad's overall average age down to 28.73 single handedly. Had the United States qualified for the 2018 World Cup, they most likely would have had the fifth oldest squad at the finals in Russia out of all 32 teams. This is actually a trend that, until recently at least, was reflected among many CONCACAF national teams, such as Mexico and Costa Rica, which routinely rank among the oldest squads in international football worldwide. But that's a curious phenomenon, which is really another discussion for another time. Following the US MNT's failure to qualify for the World Cup in 2018, their first World Cup absence since 1986, there was the one millionth inquiry into the state of US soccer and youth development, with the age of the squad during qualifying being one of the primary points of focus. Soon after that disappointment, in November 2018, the US builded a starting eleven with an average age of just 22 years and 71 days for a friendly game against Italy, in which the Stars and Stripes managed to hold their own until falling victim to a 94th minute winner at the Crystal Arena in Genk. The most senior member of that side was just 26 years old, up against an Italian outfit boasting veterans like Salvatore Sirigu, Leonardo Bonucci and Francesco Asabi. From the fifth oldest in qualifying, that squad would have been by far the youngest at the 2018 World Cup, almost four years younger than the next youngest squad, which was Nigeria, who had an average age of 
So funding for youth team soccer in the USA is increasing, the quality of youth development is improving, along with both the participation numbers among young people and the quality of play that is being produced. The MLS has never had so much young homegrown talent, the USMNT is one of the youngest national teams on earth, and the 2020 MLS season's first player of the month award, awarded for August, wasn't won by a big name overseas designated player like Javier Hernandez, Carlos Vela or Joseph Martinez, but by a 20 year old Nigerian American from Oklahoma by the name of Daryl Dyke. So what exactly is the problem, you might ask, with U-Team Soccer in the US? It all seems to be going rather well, shouldn't this video be titled, The Extraordinary Success Story of Youth Soccer in the US? Well, not quite. Just enormous strides have been made, and Youth Team Soccer in America has come on leaps and bounds since 2010, or even 5 years ago, there are still some serious flaws. The first, and I believe the most important, is the cost of participation for young people who want to play soccer for a team in the US. But before I get to that, there is a distinction that needs to be made when we are talking about youth team football, or soccer, in America. Most clubs or associations break down their youth team soccer into three, or at least two, different categories, namely recreational, advanced recreational, and travel. Some skip the middle one, which is essentially an intermediary group between recreational and travel teams. There are some clubs which are just for recreational players, and others that are just for travel, meanwhile many operate and accommodate for both types. Recreational teams are pretty much as the name suggests, although I would suggest that football ought to be a recreational activity for all children. Recreational teams tend not to have any tryouts or trials as we would say in the UK, meaning that there is no required ability level and the players get equal game time regardless of skill. Most recreational teams compete solely against local opposition and are coached by generous volunteers. As a result, playing for a recreational soccer team is cheap, typically costing a parent around $75 to $125 for a season, which tends to span from spring to autumn as we would say, or spring to fall, for the benefit of our American viewers. Travel soccer is much more competitive. Players have to pass tryouts or trials, they're required to train much more frequently, and the coaches are paid for their work. Crucially, travel soccer is also far more expensive. Participation can cost anything from $1,200 a season to over $5,000 in the most extreme examples. What's more, those costs sometimes don't even include things like kits and transportation, and as the name implies, travel soccer requires plenty of travelling. Whilst recreational teams typically only compete against neighbouring and nearby teams, travel soccer teams often have to travel large distances for tournaments in particular, and are capable of clocking up some serious air miles in a nation as vast as the United States. Naturally, advanced recreational teams, as something of a halfway house, tend to cost somewhere between the two, involving more frequent and intense training sessions, but rarely travelling long distances for games like a travel team. The problem, as you may or may not have clocked there, is that there are two main criteria required in order to play the highest level of youth soccer in the US. One is that you're good enough to, and the other is that you can afford to. Of course, many parents simply cannot cough up thousands of dollars a season in order for their child to play for a certain team, regardless of how talented they are. Food and shelter will almost always come before football. In fairness, some teams have attempted to combat this by offering scholarships, which reduce the cost of playing for a travel team so that the most talented children from the poorest backgrounds can still afford to compete. In some cases, these scholarships can offer a discount of as much as 75%, and when the problems associated with prohibitive costs crop up, US soccer like to talk about the scholarships and improvements in accessibility that have been introduced to the sport. However, really significant discounts are infrequent, not all clubs are so generous, and even with the reduction to the headline figure, many parents still cannot afford to put their kids into the best teams, even if they have the talent. For all of US soccer's claims, the figures speak for themselves. A survey published in 2019 showed that participation in soccer among children from America's poorest households, categorised as those earning less than $25,000 a year, was just 11% compared to 35% of the nation's wealthiest households, categorised as those earning in excess of $100,000 a year. That's a big difference, and it has a major impact on the appearance of every level of US soccer, since other socio-economic factors, such as race and the region in which you live, are reflected firstly in youth participation, then the MLS, and all the way up to the national team. Since black and Hispanic communities are disproportionately impoverished in the United States, they are also disproportionately underrepresented in youth team soccer, especially in relation to their skill and interest in the sport from a young age. This is in complete juxtaposition with almost every country other than the US. 
from the favelas of South America to the shanty houses in Africa, it tends to be the poorest communities that produce the highest number and the most talented footballers in the rest of the world. Even in wealthier countries like Germany, France and the UK, it is typically from working class low income families that the nation's footballing stars are produced. Here in Britain, football has long been known as the working man's game, since historically, at least since the Lancashire towns overtook the private schoolboys in the 1860s, the majority of football fans and players, from the amateur ranks right up to the national team, have come through the state school system and are not particularly wealthy. Whether it be Sadio Mane, who grew up in poverty in Senegal, or the destitution of Luis Suarez's upbringing in Salto and then Montevideo in Uruguay, football is often seen as a route out of these communities, for impoverished families and kids. And while statistically it is an extremely unlikely route, it creates a deep passion and dedication for the sport. It is worth noting that almost all MLS teams do not charge for their youth participation, with the only exception being DC United, who bizarrely still employ a pay-to-play youth team system, and Minnesota United, who I believe have a partial pay-to-play system in place. However, even with the recent 2020 expansion franchises, there are only 26 MLS teams in a nation of almost 330 million people, and three of those teams are obviously Canadian. Only 17 of the 50 US states even have an MLS team, so naturally opportunities within an MLS academy are extremely limited, both geographically and numerically. Whereas here in England, and indeed in most nations, we have a football league pyramid and non-league system, at least for now, we'll see what happens with COVID, with literally hundreds of clubs which can support youth development, the same is not true of the United States. Every single player in the current England squad came through the academy system, 100% compared to just 34% in the USMNT, although even that is a major improvement upon 24%, which was the figure in 2017, and just 8% as recently as 2015. As far as I'm aware, and I'm sure someone will correct me if I'm wrong, there is no professional football club in England which charges their academy players' parents simply for the privilege of having their child train and play for the team at various different youth levels. Indeed, the wealthier clubs are often willing to aid other expenses like travel and external education outside of the school system for parents who need financial assistance. And during the academy scholarship phase, players may be paid around four to seven thousand pounds, not dissimilar to a trainee tradesman like a bricklayer or electrician. So the only barrier to entry for parents with football-loving children here in England is travel costs, which are sometimes subsidised or outright covered, time, and the child's talents. Until this is the case in the United States, across the board, you will continue to see a gap in participation numbers based upon socio-economic factors, rather than talent alone. The best comparison I can think of for UK viewers is that football in America is a bit like Formula One here in the UK. You don't need to be a lord or a baron to give your child a chance in the sport, but you will most likely have to sacrifice a large amount of money, an amount that is simply not feasible for a great many families. What's more, some US youth leagues are run more as a business than merely as a tool in which to develop young players, inevitably leading to profit, taking precedence over accessibility and maximising potential. If leagues drive up admission costs, teams have to drive up participation fees, and so the vicious cycle continues. This hasn't gone unnoticed in America, of course, and recent Tottenham signing Alex Morgan commented not so long ago that the US youth structures are more of a business than a grassroots sport. There are other problems too, such as the focus on physicality and results at a very early age over talent and player development. This is a mistake we are all too familiar with here in England, having spent decades lagging behind our European counterparts and only really having learnt our lesson over the last 5-10 to 10 years. You still hear stories of footballers being dumped out of academies for being too short, an idiocy which knows no bounds when the finest player on the planet stands at just 5 foot 7 and required growth hormones just to reach such a grand height. According to a number of foreign coaches based in America though, the US still requires significant progress on this front, with a strong focus on athleticism rather than aptitude on the ball and understanding of the game remaining prevalent. This is a quicker fix, as far as I'm concerned, so long as the higher-ups within US soccer acknowledge the problem. I expect MLS teams to take the lead on this front with a more progressive and evidence-based approach to their youth team programs which should trickle down to the youth team ranks nationwide. The problem of financial accessibility is less easy to fix, and seems to me to be somewhat ingrained. History shows that anywhere in the world, but particularly in America, when a profit motive is introduced, genuine change is hard to implement. 
but implemented the US must, because without participation being based solely on skill, the US may end up with a competitive league and national team capable of making a splash at the old World Cup, but I don't see how they can ever hope to compete with the Germany's, France's and Brazil's of this world. There are lots of other aspects of U-team soccer in the US that I'd love to discuss, and one of the major problems is obviously that the geography and interest in the sport in America dictates that many children grow up in towns, cities, or oftentimes even entire states that are almost entirely devoid of youth team opportunities, regardless of household incomes. As ever with this channel though, there are not enough hours in the day for me to write and research it all, and I'm writing this script in the early hours with a whole other video that I need to write and research after this before I go to bed. Nonetheless, I hope you enjoyed today's video, please do hit the like button if so. Thank you all as ever for watching, with a big howdly doodly neighborino to our US viewers whose support is always much appreciated, and I wish you and your nation's soccer team all the best, with the exception of if and or when you face England. Feel free to leave your thoughts in the comment section down below, obviously do not hesitate to subscribe and turn on notifications for hitc 7s if you don't already, and if the daily uploads on YouTube still aren't enough for you, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram, where the username is simply at hitc 7s on both.